People from Grand Prairie in Canada invited me to uh, present lectures on archaeology. They saw the stuff on amazing discoveries. So I went there and a very polite lady took me to their museum. And you're looking at an intertype linotype in the museum of Grand Prairie. And uh, I'm going to speak about the increase of knowledge. Look at this. Most modern, from yesterday, technology lands up in a museum. I was a printer operator for many years, from 16 to 26. And then I became a literature evangelist, a call porter, for three years. And then a translator from English to my native language, Afrikaans. And then I enrolled at an old age of 30 years in a theological studies. And then I met up with higher criticism. I thought everybody believed in the Bible. But what a shock. And that same year, 1966, my father invited me to come with him to the Middle East. I said, no, I'm a student. I haven't got money. I've got a child and a wife. But, you know, the older folk, they said, you do this, and that's all. <laughs> so I had to pay for the land arrangements. In my money, it was 200 uh, rand. In American money, about $20. So we went. But in my studies, I looked at the, the war against God's book, the Bible, and I decided with my little knowledge and small little brain, I'm going to research archaeology to show people the Bible is authentic. And it happened here at uh, Tyre. My dad and I went down to Tyre and they've just excavated uh, some stuff and you're looking some of them. And inside one of the sarcophagus was a skeleton. <laughs> and I offered the assistant archaeologist a pound for the skull and uh, this part of the arm. And he stood like a statue. I said two. Started to breathe. I said three pounds, English pounds. <clears throat> and he cleared his throat and I said four. And he went into the <laughs> the sarcophagus and he brought me a skull and a part of an arm. You know, and there something happened to me, something strange happened to my heart, like Wesley says. And this passion to go to places all over the Middle East, just to confirm the Bible is God's book. I'm standing here at the Zikharut, tremendous temple tower in Iraq, and uh, the site here is called Dur Kurikhalsu. Kurikhalsu was, was the man who built this uh, beautiful worship place, and Dur means it's his, his fortress. Dur means fortress. The theology of salvation, we call it deterministic fatalistic. What the God says that's final. You cannot change it. A difficult theology, so different to the theology of the Bible, where you have a choice. Climb the steps and you are saved. The God upstairs will accept your climbing as a form of salvation. You are forgiven. <laughs> Climbing steps. But if you're too old, you've had it. So only young people can earn salvation. And now for a, a visit to the most famous city in the ancient world. Can you guess what it is? Babylon. Who restored the southern palace of Nebuchadnezzar? Would you like to guess? Saddam Hussein. He was a student of Sumerian literature. He wrote in Sumerian literature. Amount of bricks, he used 60 million bricks to just restore a part of the southern palace. 
Would you like to see an unintended prophetic painting of this great man, Saddam Hussein? I discovered it here at uh, Babylon. There you see it. Now look, look at this painting. It's huge. It's not there anymore. I was there a few months ago, but it's gone. Not everybody liked him. Now, how many ancient people do you see in Saddam's painting? Uh, have a good look. Uh, let's move a little closer. There you see it. Uh, just in front of his face you see Nebuchadnezzar. And then at the end you see Cyrus depicted in this painting. Now Saddam Hussein knew the history, maybe the prophecies. I wonder who assisted him. Now Cyrus was not the only one that conquered Babylon. Who assisted Cyrus? And this is what I love about biblical archaeology. He was assisted by a prophet. A prophet who mentioned the name of the king who assisted him. Let's, let's see what it says here. Did the prophets predict the involvement of the Medes in the capture of Babylon? This is very important because the scholars fight against the authenticity of the book of Daniel. And I did deep research, found marvelous material that confirms the Bible. Okay, let's, let's look at this. Now, this is one of the rooms in which officials like Daniel lived. Uh, the Queen Mother lived on the other side of the, the restored uh, temple. And Daniel lived on this side, opposite side. Now, did God reveal to Daniel the history of the world from the time of, of his rule as a world ruler to the time of Christ? Yes, he saw it in pictures twice. And you can read this in Daniel chapter 2 and 7. Did prophecy come true? Yes. Now who else prophesied about the future of Babylon? Uh, here at the Echmun temple, close to Sidon in, uh, in Lebanon, look at this, you see a, a zikharut in front of you and then a huge edifice, a podium on the, on the other side. Now at this site you can see all the four kingdoms that Daniel predicted would be there. And here, yeah, all of them are in place. Now let's turn to the book of Jeremiah concerning a prophecy given by this marvelous prophet Jeremiah. It says in chapter 29 verse 1, Now these are the words of the letter of Jeremiah, the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainders of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now both prophets, Isaiah and, and Jeremiah, prophesied that the Medes would be part of the capture of Babylon. Now, can archaeology confirm the time of the siege of the city and the deportation of the Judeans to Babylon? This happened after Jeconiah, that is Jehoiakim, the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. So here we get the time period. The Bible mentions the name of the ruling king who was taken captive. Can archaeology confirm this tragic event? And this is what I love about archaeology. It confirms that your Bible is a book from God. In 1957, that's not too long ago, archaeologists discovered the Babylonian Chronicle, and you're looking at it right here which consists of several clay tablets. This is just one of them. Now these clay tablets mention the first 11 years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. 
that's from 605 to 594. We hope to discover more of these tablets. Both the Bible and the Babylonian Chronicles agree of the date of the siege as 597. This was a tremendous breakthrough. Archaeologists found 300 clay tablets while excavating at Babylon. What was found on this specific one? The name of the king of Jerusalem, Joachim, with his wife and five of his children. It speaks about the daily rations they received. Wow! So there was a king like Joachim. He ruled only for three months and 20 days. If you visit the uh, biblical, the Bible Museum in Jerusalem next to the Knesset and the, the large museum, you'll find some inscriptions, Sumerian, Akkadian, where it mentions six liters. And here you can see exactly what says the clay tablet, what they received every day. You know, God preserved these clay tablets for a time in which we live, to tell you that the Bible is true. And there you've got the clay tablet, <laughs> with a description in German, English, etc., uh, mentioning the name of Jehoiakim. I love the Bible. I trust the Bible. I don't trust everything I read, but when I read the Bible, my heart warms. I was more impressed by a little clay tablet, recently discovered, mentioning the name of a king of Jerusalem than the lions on the procession street in Babylon and in the Berlin Pergamon Museum. I trust the Bible. While visiting the ruins of the northern palace of Nebuchadnezzar, I thought of a marvelous story that Jeremiah told of Jehoiakim of Jerusalem and the Babylonian king Evil. Merudach. It says, Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, that evil Merudach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim. His head was in a stash. <laughs> lifted up his head the head of Joachim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. This sounds ridiculous. And that's why the, the critics say the Bible is a storybook. It's full of myths. It's unreal. Now, the question is, what caused this new king, son of Nebuchadnezzar, Evel Merodach, to release a hated rebel and a criminal from a Babylonian prison. This was unseen. And you know, even today, the rabbis in their targums and uh, <laughs> literature has got a, a, a problem with this. But you know, the Bible is so true. It says, and he spoke kindly to him. What? To a hated criminal, a rebel? He spoke kindly to Jehoiakim and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. What is Jeremiah trying to tell? The ancient exiles, the losers. What is he trying to tell me? And what is he trying to tell you in this story? Because when you read the history, it's going down down, down. The ten tribes are gone. Judah is gone. They made a mess. And here comes a story of a king that's being released from prison. What was he trying to tell God's devastated people? And we are also devastated. So here's a message for us. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon. Hey, he gets his food from the king. A, a portion for each day until the day of his death, all the days of his life. 
from shame and degradation. King Jehoiakim rose to the highest position of honor and he sat next to the ruler of the ancient world all his days. What a story. What a story. William Shea, one of my favorite historiologists, I met him personally. I went with him in search for the Ark of Noah in Armenia. He discovered some interesting clay tablets uh, which shed some light on what happened here. Now, when the three Hebrews were cast into the fiery furnace, even Merodach, the present king now in Babylon, was an eyewitness. He saw those three young men and he also saw Christ meeting with them in the furnace. Now, subsequent to this divine miracle, subsequent to this divine miracle, he appointed Abednego as his secretary because he saw in this young friend of Nebuchadnezzar, a man of integrity, somebody that, that's prepared to die because of principles. So he influenced evil Merodach. Do you think the dialogue between Abednego and evil Merodach about the God who rescued his children was brief or was it lengthy? I think he said, listen, man, Abednego, tell me, how did, you, how did it feel when you went down into that hot oven? And did your God touch you? And he testified of his God to the next king of Babylon. Abednego, please tell me more. <laughs> and they spent hours together speaking of the God that Abednego and Daniel and the others served. Much brilliant, brighter and greater than Bel Marduk, the famous Babylonian god. I found this ancient oil lamp at the Bible Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, what do you see? Is it possible for you to see it? This is a, just an enlargement. It's the three Hebrew Hebrews in the Bible, in the furnace, with King Nebuchadnezzar. So even in ancient art, this marvelous happening is recorded. And just to tell you that it's not fiction, it's true. What happened to Daniel when evil Merodach inherited the throne? According to William Shea, he asked Abednego, to become one of his counselors. And he had exposure to Abednego's theology about the God of Israel, and now he received uh, uh, information from Daniel himself about the God who loves sinners, so different to the Babylonian gods. I trust that future clay tablets will shed more light on this amazing story. What are the tools we should use in Bible study according to Jesus in Matthew 12? Uh, we call it typology. That's just an academic word. That explains something simple. Name a few things in the temple that pointed to the greatest, to Jesus. And it says in Matthew 12, 6, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one, referring to the temple, greater than the temple. Can you think of a few things in the ancient Jewish temple that pointed forward to a coming Messiah, a Redeemer? Oh, there are so many. The entire Old Testament is, is a Christ-centered book pointing you to the lamb, to the light, to the bread, to the water, <laughs> to the aroma. Christ is everything in the Old Testament. So the priests are types of the greater priest, Jesus Christ. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, 
so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is inclusive reckoning, the style that uh, used by the Hebrews. So, prophets are types of Christ, the great anti-typical prophet. And it says here, the men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with the generation, with this generation speaking to the people there, and condemn it. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater, and he pointed to himself, then Jonah is here. He says to the audience, you can understand me better when you study the lives of the prophets. I am the perfect prophet to serve you in order to save you. What else in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus? The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. He was the most brilliant man of his time. And then Jesus looked them into the eyes and says, And indeed, and indeed, a greater than Solomon, pointing to himself, is here. The entire Old Testament points forward to him. The priest, the prophet, and the king. What about evil Merodach? Let's go back to him. Somewhere here in ancient Babylon, a prisoner heard a voice that was kinder than the voice of the wardens. He never heard such a beautiful voice. It was the voice of the king of the ancient earth, taking the place of his father Nebuchadnezzar. He heard the king's voice. Would you like to hear the king's voice speaking to you in kind tones? And he spoke kindly to him. Can you hear the voice of another king, King Jesus? speaking kindly to you in your prison of guilt and pain and rejection. This history wants to bring us hope. And now we, we can hear his voice through faith and reading the Bible. But soon, that voice will address each one of you and you'll hear his voice. I wonder what he's going to say to you, to me. The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. They wanted to arrest Jesus and they sent the soldiers. And they listened to Jesus. Came back, where's the, the culprit? Sirs, no one ever spoke like this man. When you read the Bible, you hear the voice of someone else who loves you dearly. You know, not everybody loves you. It's all right. He loves you. And he wants to speak to you through his word, the Bible. And you can believe the Bible. One of the nine palaces of Saddam Hussein at Babylon. Is there a dress code for visitors to the king's palace? Of course. So Jehoiakim changed from his prison garments. Man, the smell of that old prison clothes was revolting. <laughs> Maybe he had that <laughs> same dress for many years. What happens when I allow Jesus to visit me in my prison cell of guilt? He changes my cloak of dirt, of sin, and clothes me with his own righteousness. This is a beautiful story. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is so beautiful. 
because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To preach good tidings to the poor, not only the physical poor. We are poor in spirit, we sit with hang-ups, we are poor. He has sent me to heal the broken-hearted. We are sick up here. He wants to heal us, heal us from our pain syndrome, to proclaim liberty to captives. You know, we, we are cap captives of our own fallen sinful nature. But he has a, a promise to liberate us from our captivity of sin and the opening of the prison to those who are, who are bound. He wants to release us from the prison of misery into his perfect kingdom of love and peace. Oh, read the Bible. It's a marvelous book. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, that's this, the enemies, to comfort all who mourn. Are you mourning? He wants to comfort you. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. Have you ever looked at ashes? It's ugly. He says, <laughs> we've got ugly ashes. But instead of the ashes of our misery, he wants to give us the beauty of his character. What a God. To give beauty for ashes. Ashes means something burnt up, there's nothing left. Whatever we've lost, he wants to give us something beautiful in its place. The oil of joy for mourning. Beautiful imagery. Oil in ancient times were very precious, was very precious. Different kinds of oil. But he wants to, with the oil of the Holy Spirit, comfort us. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Have you got a heavy spirit? <laughs> he wants to give you a garment of praise, of thanksgiving, of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Can you imagine the joy when Jesus will come to take away our filthy, sinful clothes, rags, and dress us in the garments of his pure, shining, perfect, sinless righteousness. Man, man, we are going to be dressed up in the garments of Christ's perfection. I'm looking forward to the new clothes and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Now there were many kings in Babylon who ate with the king and Joachim got the seat next to the king. From shame and degradation King Jehoiakim rose to the highest position of honor and sat next to the ruler of the ancient world all the days of his life. Where will Jesus seat us when he comes to rescue us from the prison of pain and guilt? Rescue us from our fallen human nature? Where will he seat us in heaven? And I saw thrones. On the Isle of Patmos, uh, the old man, John, looks into the future. And I saw thrones. Man, a throne has got so much beauty and symbolism in it. And they sat on them. It's you and me. And judgment was committed to them. Uh, are you going to be a, a judge and a king? next to Christ. He's got marvelous plans for us. Don't get lost. <laughs> you, you cannot miss out on all the wonders he wants to give you. 
God has not only comforted a devastated nation and their king, but he restored their former glory. You and I did not have a perfect spotless past, but he promises us a perfect spotless future. How do you like this? What a marvelous book. Trust every word you read. This is ancient Nippur, biblical Kalne, mentioned in Genesis 10 verse 10. Where does the prophet Ezekiel fit into this picture? Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The poor exile, prisoner Ezekiel looks up and he saw God. And this is what God wants us to see, not, not the misery of our lives, the lives of others. He wants us to look up to him and see him in all his beauty. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So he also mentions Jehoiakim. The siege of Jerusalem was in 597. Five years later would bring us to 592. In these dark days of exile, God revealed to Ezekiel that he is still in charge. And when you read the Bible, and please read it, you'll discover that God is still in charge of your life. You think it's a mess. He is busy, he's in charge. Trust him. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kebar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. The hand of the Lord was upon this prisoner, this exile, this captive. The same hand is upon you, my friend. It's a wonderful healing hand. Ezekiel and 10,000 of the cream of Jerusalem were exiled, not to Babylon, but to where? To Nippur, Kalne. Now, can archaeology confirm the existence of the river Kebar. Yes, I found it. Here you look at a, a map. This is what you see in the Bible Museum in Jerusalem. You see the exact place where the 10,000 captives and Ezekiel were placed at Nippur. That's where they settled. Now, the Sumerian name is Nar Kabari. That's for the Kebar River. And uh, the people they just put below this clay tablet the name Kebar. Bible is true. It just had another name. You know, this is exciting. The Bible mentions the fact that Ezekiel and 10,000 of the exiles settled next to the Kebar River. And here we see the evidence. Time and again, archaeology says you can trust the Bible. Don't let people tell you any negative thing about this book. The clay tablets tell us that the exiles even built a city called Al Yahutu. Al Yahutu. There's the clay tablet. The earliest document in the collection dates back to 572 BCE, about 15 years after the destruction of the temple during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II. The most recent tablet dates back to 477 during the reign of Xerxes I, about 60 years after the return to Zion began and about 20 years before the rise of Ezra the scribe. We've got info from that period. 
So you can read the book Ezra and Nehemiah with confidence. Archaeology backs up the authenticity of these books. The names of two of the Jews who lived in the city of Al Yahudu indicate that they are planning to immigrate to Judah. The names of the two Yaeli and Sidur. Did they accept the invitation of Cyrus to pay for their journey from Babylonia to Jerusalem? This is all we have in here. I hope they accepted the invitation to go from Babylon to Jerusalem. Everyday life in Yehuda, they discovered many, many interesting stuff here. Their lives were similar to those of slaves, but they made something of their miserable position. And they worked themselves up. And some of them became very, very rich. I read some material from the excavations of Nippur. How they had a big firm there. The latest discovery of a cuneiform tablet from Al Yahudu archive. Here's another one. Written 110 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and more than 60 years after the edict of Cyrus that the Jews may return to Jerusalem. They also discovered this receipt from Al Yahudu. So they had a good uh, bookkeeping system. Within a few months after the conquest of Jerusalem by Cyrus and Darius, the Mede in 538. Now this period may be reflected in the famous lines from Psalms 137 on the exiles. Listen what it says. By the rivers of Babylon, the Kebar River, there we sat down, yea, we wept. Can you see them weeping there? When we remembered Zion, you know, when we, when we look back to the good old times, tears run down our cheeks. <laughs> we hanged our hops on the willows in the midst thereof. Boom, boom. No more singing. <laughs> For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. Hey, man, we want to listen to some Judean songs. Please sing or something. And they that wasted us, required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then they said, how shall we sing the Lord's song? In a strange land, we can only sing a song in Zion. We cannot sing here. You're looking at the names of some of the exiles who refuse to sing. You know, when I do research and I look at this stuff, these Bible images come back to me. The instruments of music hanging on a tree, they refuse to sing. And my dear friend, have you stopped singing? in your strange land of pain and disappointment. Please, please start singing again. And don't let anybody stop you from singing. It's one of the best therapies to lift up your spirits. You know, these clay tablets were covered by Mesopotamian sands for more than 2,000 years. And just the other day, they were discovered, crying out, the stones are crying out, the Bible is true. What is the message of the Assyrian Lamusa? You're looking at it right here. It's called the Sumerian protective deity. Big bull, they thought he could protect them. For more than 2,000 years, nobody knew what's, what was written here. Here you're looking at, at the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Why did these hieroglyphics wait for more than 2,000 years before revealing their secrets? And this is what we're going to do in our next lecture. 
I invite you to the miracle stories of how Luvian Hittite hieroglyphics were discovered and deciphered at Bossat in 1946, just the other day. Thousands of them cry out, the Bible is true. It is the book that tells you and me about a God, a personal God, that loves us and wants to save us. It is a book that tells you about a God of love, great love, that wants to save you. In our next lecture, I'm going to take you to this exact site where one of the greatest discoveries was made. It was also a fulfillment of prophecy that at the end of time, knowledge concerning the book of Daniel would increase. And we'll be visiting Hattusas in uh, Turkey as well. Hittite inscriptions, we're going to look at that. A, sorry, a, a seriologist, Hugo Winkler, excavated here at Hattusas in 19. 06, and he discovered 30,000 clay tablets. They still have to translate some of them. Why did the United Nations have to wait centuries upon centuries before the first peace treaty was discovered? Here you see it was dis discovered in, in, uh, in Syria, 1275. It's displayed there. You cannot afford to miss the next lecture, my friend. We're living at the time of the end, and archaeology and the Bible is going to tell us more about the time in which we live. Come and listen to the story of the Rosetta Stone and the prophecy of Daniel and the time of the end in his book on archaeology. Unger writes that 798 was the birth of archaeology. That is the same prophecy that you find in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Father in heaven, we are overwhelmed with all the evidences that confirms the authenticity of your book. Help us to take time to expose ourselves to the messages coming from your heart of love in Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.